people say to me, but how am I going to go and do ministry if I don't get the vaccine? And I say to you to them now, <laughs> if God really needed you to go there, because he had no other person there to go, he can transport you there supernaturally without you needing to put poison into your body. This is our God. You understand? This is a, we don't have to use these low level excuses, belittling what God can do. If God wants us somewhere and he specifically wants you, because he can, he might want specifically you, he can supernaturally do these things. He's done it before. Supernatural transportation. This has happened in our lifetime, not just in the Bible. It's recorded from lifetime to lifetime. I read books of amazing men and women of God talking about this weird stuff where they'll go through a door and they're up in another city. Coming out and they're already in that city. We look in the Bible where we see Philip baptizing. And once he gets out of the water, he's transported to another state. Comes out of the water, wet, and he's transported to another state and starts walking in that state. It's like me baptizing someone in Limassol and then out of the blue, after I finish baptizing them, I'm actually starting to walk in Larnaga. And I'm going, okay, what are we doing here, Lord? This is the Bible. It's in the book of Acts. This is our God. And I'm telling you, when we are going to walk His ways, I'm going to just talk to you. When we want to walk His ways, please just read who this God is that's called us. Are we kidding? Like, we're talking about the God that in Deuteronomy talks about how that the Israelites, when they, he moved them out of, you know, I talk about Egypt, how God removed them out of Egypt and take them into the wilderness. And for 40 years, they were going in the wilderness until they went into the promised land. The next generation went into the promised land. Do you know what it says in that, in that book when he talks about them? He says he made even their clothes grow with them. Yeah. What? Did you know that? He says their feet did not swell, but their sandals grew with their feet. This is in the Bible. This is our God. You know why? Because they didn't have my mall in the wilderness to go and get another, you know, goat skin, Gucci sandals. They were walking with what they had. And these kids that we remember, they would have been one years old by the time they became, because it was 40 years they were camping and going around in circles in the wilderness. This one-year-old kid, my son, is three months old nearly. We're talking about by the end of them going round and round in circles, my son would be 40 years old and three months. Check that out. And imagine his clothes, which are kind of funny to be growing up with those clothes. <laughs> They're growing with him. Sandals are growing with him. Do you hear this God? Do you see if this can happen? What's the limit? What limit is there in our God? Nothing. Nothing. God has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. And everything, if everything was stripped from us, doesn't matter because it's not about the stuff. God, you are the same yesterday, today and forever. I belong to you. But he makes these weird promises. And there's always a condition in the promise. And I've heard some things. And I guess I kind of started believing them and quoting them myself, but I'm shifting from there a little bit. Because all over the Bible, <clears throat> he says this, if you hearken unto my voice, if you hearken unto my voice, you know what the old word hearken means? It means to listen and obey, to hear and obey, not just hear my voice, but to hear and do what I just said. This will happen and this blessing and this protection will come upon you. Every time it says, if you hearken unto my voice, these things. Because to listen and obey means you need to trust the one who spoke to obey what he said. Yes. Do you get the difference? Yes. So when I say hearken unto my voice, he's also add into that ingredient trusting. Because it's faith. I mean, trust is to have faith. Faith is to have trust. So all this package was hearken unto my voice. And he promises, if you go and study the word hearken, you have to go to the old King James and go to a concordance or whatever, a search thing and say hearken and look everywhere, hearken unto my voice, this quote. Look at everything he promises right after that. 
If you will trust me, I will stop this. I will do this. I will provide for you. Even if there's pestilences, you'll be okay. Even if there's everything droughts, you will be like a water tree. All these promises going, what do you mean? He's saying when it's dark, when things are failing, when things are impossible for you to make it in the flesh, in the logic, in the physical. It doesn't make sense. I will provide. I will clothe you. I will take care of you. Do not worry about tomorrow. And he keeps going on and on. I count the hairs of your head. But it goes always, especially in the Old Testament, if you hearken unto my voice. If you hearken unto my voice, I will do this stuff. I'm telling you that those who will not hearken unto his voice, but still believe the Lord, this stuff will not come to them. In other words, this is what I'm trying to say now. The supernatural is not to be expected. The super provision of God doesn't skip hearken unto my voice. It doesn't just jump on you because you say you believe in God. If you believe in God, God's version of believing in God means this, hearken unto my voice. If you love me, you'll obey me. Remember, this is all how he used to speak, right? He still speaks like this. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do the things which I say? He's still obsessed about do, hearken unto my voice. Do what I said. If he's still obsessed about this reality, he hasn't changed. But there's grace that's changed. So he's got, there's a grace time right now. But he has, doesn't mean because there's grace, you don't hearken unto his voice and everything just comes to you anyway because of grace. No. If we hearken unto his voice, you know something? I was talking to my wife about this because I went, whoa, wow. With Job. Job. We speak about Job a lot in and kind of like, oh, look what happened to Job. Forget that for a minute. Just listen to the first chapter of Job, what he says. He says that he was a righteous man. He was perfect. He was a good man. He, in other words, righteous meaning he obeyed. He hearkened unto God. He loved God with his whole life. He would, he would throw a party with his family. In other words, you have a get-together like our families do, our parents do. They'll bring, like we have a barbecue together and stuff like that. And he goes, after that, he'll go and sacrifice some bulls and all that kind of stuff. Just in case they thought something sinful. If his kids thought something sinful, he'll even sacrifice some animals for, him, for, for them to pray to God for mercy. So there was this protection over him. And how do we know this? Because read the first chapter of Job. He says that Satan appeared with the other sons of God, which means the other angels. And God says to him, how did you get here? So the sons of God, the angels, came to assemble before God. They had a meeting to talk to God. And Satan appeared with them, he says. And he says, how did you get here to God? God says to Satan. And he has a conversation, a weird conversation with Satan. And he says, I came amongst the earth, blah, blah, blah. He says, it's chapter one, you can go and read it. And he says this, have you considered, God says this to him. He intentionally puts his attention on Job. Have you considered my servant Job? And he says this to him. You have put, how can I? He's, he, he would just be like anybody else. He goes, no, he wouldn't. In other words, they're having a conversation. He says, the only reason he takes care, he loves you like he does, is because you put a hedge of protection around him. How did the hedge come? It comes automatic. How? When you hearken unto my voice. He promised this from Deuteronomy, Exodus, everywhere. If you do this, I will do this for you. I will be around you. You will be there. I will be a pillar. I'll be your refuge. He promises all this stuff if you hearken unto my voice. So Job was the kind of guy who just loved and obeyed God with all his heart. He was real. He wasn't trying to obey God so he doesn't go to hell. He loved God and wanted to obey God. And because of this, there was a hedge. And he literally admits that in the Bible. And he says to him, okay, remove the hedge. I will attack him. And God goes to him, okay, but you can't take his life. You can attack anything you want, but you can't take his life. And Job still won't curse me. And that's exactly what did. Job didn't love God because of what he had. Job didn't love God because of the blessings he was getting from God. Because when everything was taken away, you are Lord. The Lord gives, the Lord taketh away. His own wife would come out and tell Job, just curse God and get her and done with. That's a bad wife, by the way. Careful who you marry. 
She says to him, just curse him, get over and done with. And he wouldn't do it. And honestly, I think any one of us would have broke in the first death of the son that he had. All his children were killed by Satan. Not God, by Satan. Remember, God says you do what you want to do, but you can't take his life. God restored sevenfold. God restored things after the end of this trial that happened. But it was never God who did it. The attacks. The point is, the lesson of Job is, we see that there was a hedge of protection automatically by default around him. How? Because he was a man that hearkened unto God's voice. It's a time to walk holy, set apart for God. Holy in this way that I'm speaking. Set yourself apart saying, no more God. I am for you. I am yours, really. Do with me as you wish. And in your heart and actions, hearken unto the Lord. Live a life that is obedient to the Lord. That doesn't mean you beat yourself up if you, made a, uh, if you stuffed, up, stuffed that up. You get back up, but your vision, your intention, your heart is, I'm going to obey my Lord. I'm going to live a life that hearkens unto my God. If you fall, get back up. I'm going to live a life unto my God, holy unto God. Don't let a day go past where you let yourself sleep in self-pity for being guilty or, or failing that day. That was the mistake. You don't go to sleep because you failed that day. You don't let the sun go down before you say, God, I failed today, but I'm yours. That's how you do it. When you go to sleep thinking you're a failure, so you're not even deserve, you're not worthy to pray to him, Satan just fooled you. Satan just fooled you. It wasn't you thinking, oh, you know, uh, how can I even pray to God? Look what I've done. That sounds nice, but you got fooled by the devil. Why? Because you love God. And you feel, look what I've done. How can I even pray to God? I've done that yesterday and I said I wasn't going to do it again. And I'm going to pray to God now. Yes. Pray to God now. But I said I'm not going to do it again and I did. Yes. And you meant it every time. You weren't saying it like an actor. You weren't saying, I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> you meant it. I'm not going to do it again, Lord. You were broken. You were repenting. The temptation came, but you found yourself weak. And you gave in again. You brush yourself off. It doesn't mean it was okay. It doesn't mean you want to do it again. But that is not your heart either. And if it is, you're not a Christian. But your heart is, I don't want to do it again. I keep doing what I don't want to do. Who will deliver me from this? This is Romans chapter 7, verse 8. Chapter 8 answers it. Praise be to God. Jesus Christ delivered me from this. People stick to chapter 7 where he talks about how he used to be. What I want to do, I don't do. And what I try to do, I do the opposite. And I'll keep doing it. And he talks like this. And then he asks this question that he answers. Who will deliver me from this? Praise be to God, Jesus Christ. And he goes back to the one who can do this and has done this. That was the answer. It wasn't to boast on how I keep failing and God's grace. So don't go to sleep again by being fooled by the devil that you are not okay to pray and say, God, forgive me. I did it again. You know, there's this book and audio that I like watching and uh, listening to because someone recorded it on YouTube as an audio. So I got the audio and I listen now in my car and everything. Okay. It's brother Lawrence practicing the presence of God. Brother Lawrence is an old monk. He's dead. He's alive with God, but he's died, died physically here. Uh, and he said, and, and, he, and he just confesses to this person that's asking him to write letters to help him to help them learn how to walk with God because he, would, he was able to walk with God. Like just have this love bouncing off him and he would live this lifestyle for God. And he says this, when I failed God, I would just turn around and say to God, God, that's all I will ever do unless you do this in me. And that's what he did. And then he goes, I didn't do another second thought about it. I just continued on as if I never sinned. Because he already came to God and said, listen, God, that's what I ever do if you don't remove 
don't break this, destroy this from me. And he knew that he wants to. He desires, he does everything he can so God can do what he can't do. But he does what he can and then God does what you can't. You understand? But you don't beat yourself up until he does it. You move forward that day until you see why. Man, it's been three weeks since I've done that sin that I always do. Wow. Usually it's every week. And then it's three weeks. Then it's four months. Then it's six months. Then it's just disappearing. You're not even thinking about it anymore because he has no hold on you. You're not focused on when it stops. You're focusing on him as he does the good work in you. Who began the good work, he will finish it. What do you do? Every night, if you stuffed up, don't go to sleep thinking I'm not worthy to pray to God and ask him for forgiveness because that's what I did last week. And I did the same thing again. That's what I did yesterday. And I still did what I said I wasn't going to do. You have a heart after God's own heart. That's what David was. In the Bible, it says, David was a man after God's own heart. And then I'm thinking, wow. And then I start reading about David. I'm thinking, what? He took another man's wife, committed adultery. He got the guy murdered because he got the woman pregnant. And now the husband's going to find out. So he gets the guy to come forward and march forward in the army in the, in the fight so he can get killed first. He intentionally gets the guy murdered. And I'm like, what? And he's after God's own heart? How is he after God's own heart? And God loved David. It's so that, think about this. Ready? Ready? Jesus, son of David. What? What? Did you see the line? God brought Jesus from the son of David. This David that stuffed up. We're not glorifying us doing stuff ups. We're saying God is the God who can redeem the stuff ups. The God that looks past the mud and the filth and will lift up and raise up a king out of you. And a queen. You need to let him do that. Stop believing what you think so low about you because it's not about what you think. It's about what he thinks. Jesus, son of David. This is our Lord. Well, why, why was he called David, the man after God's own heart? Because no matter what he did wrong, he never ran away from God. He ran to God with his wrong. Did you hear that? The reason why he was called a man after God's own heart is not because he was perfect and did nothing wrong. In fact, he did things that we never have done. Murders a man for no reason. A soldier that was faithfully trying to fight for his army. That is disgusting what he does. Gets the guy murdered. But why is he a man after God's own heart? Because he wouldn't make excuses. He always ran to God with his wrong. Say, Lord, change me, Lord. He ran after God's heart. A man after God's own heart. He wanted God's heart to be what was in him. That's the key for all us all. Stop giving up. It's a time where he's looking for a holy people set apart for an amazing time that's come. These times are dark that's come. It's just a reality. But when this what we were born, that's why we were called the light of the world. Jesus didn't come on some cruisy lifestyle, he came as a light into this world because this world was dark. Then he said, I am the light of the world. Then he says later, you are the light of the world. We were born for this time and the darker things get, the brighter we're going to shine. How? When we are setting ourselves apart wholly unto him. Otherwise, we're going to shine Jesus light when the world is looking for hope. Looking for answers, looking for stability when everyone's falling apart, or we're going to fall just like the world, calling ourselves Christians. Why? Because we didn't make a choice, set ourselves apart wholly unto the Lord. This is how you don't shake. You make the decision before the time comes. There's a man called Curry Blake. He said his father was an alcoholic, full on alcoholic. He never touched alcohol in his life. Do you know what he said? He said, I made up my mind. That I will never touch alcohol from a young age to God. I said, I'm never, I'm never going to touch alcohol. I saw what it did to my father. I'm never going to touch it. And that helped me, he said, when I came in front of friends like a party. 
And I've come many times in front of friends with a party and they're all throwing beers and drinking, you know, blah, blah, blah. It was easy for me to say no because I didn't have to make the decision every time at the moment that it happened. He already pre-made his decision before any party, before any temptation. You see the difference? That's why this is still the time where we say, guys, set yourself apart holy unto him. That doesn't mean you've done everything right up to this point. But you're saying, God, you began the good work in me. You're going to finish it. I know you will. But I set myself apart wholly unto you. Use me for your glory. Do with me as you wish. Do it before the time comes where it's the drink, the temptation to deny that. The drink, the temptation of whatever this world, whatever's going to happen, whatever's going on, if it goes on, if it does, don't make the decision at that last minute. Pre-make the decision where you stand. It's time to set ourselves apart wholly.